So for our next uh, discussion, we will talk about the plain film approach to adult heart disease. And the best advice here is to work from the outside to the inside of the chest radiograph. There is a finding on this chest radiograph that we will get to later on in this talk. So in terms of the uh, important factors to evaluate on the chest radiograph, I've listed them here. These that are highlighted in bold are actually going to be the most important. Uh, but as we're evaluating the chest radiograph, we want to look at technical factors and skeletal abnormalities. Usually these are not helpful to skeletal abnormalities, but sometimes if there's a particular finding, you might be able to hit a home run. And then situs, which is usually obvious if there's a situs abnormality when you evaluate the chest radiograph. But these are the most important factors to really look at. The pulmonary vascularity is the uh, most important thing to, uh, to evaluate on the chest radiograph, which gives you some underlying physiologic information as to the status of the cardiovascular system. We want to look at the great vessels, the vascular pedicle, the position of the great vessel, the size and shape. The heart, notice we get to the heart rather low down in the list. We want to look at the position, size, shape, especially the status of the left atrium. That could be quite helpful in adult heart disease. And then calcifications. You want to look for any abnormal calcifications on the radiograph related to the heart. So starting with technical factors, we know that if a chest radiograph is underexposed, it can look like pulmonary venous congestion. The patient positioning is important. If the patient is rotated, that can distort the appearance of the great vessels. We know the difference between a PA and an AP film is that the heart can look larger on the AP film. And then upright versus supine radiographs. On the supine radiographs, it tends to accentuate the pulmonary vascularity and it can simulate vascular congestion. Inspiration versus expiration uh, is very similar. On expiratory views, the heart size can appear larger and the pulmonary vascularity can be accentuated. So in uh, thoracic musculoskeletal skeletal structures, starting with rib notching, we all know about rib notching and that, of course, this is uh, related to coarctation of the aorta as illustrated here on this black blood MR image. Um, but rib notching is a, is a very difficult finding to be sure of on a chest radiograph. If you think you see rib notching on a chest radiograph and you're considering coarctation, the next place to look really is at the contour of the aorta. So what you want to look for is this figure of three contour in the descending thoracic aorta. And if you have that in association with rib notching, then you may really be dealing with a case of coarctation. So rib notching occurs on the undersurface of the posterior third to eighth ribs, and it occurs because of dilatation of the intercostal arteries uh, acting as collateral vessels when we have coarctation of the aorta. So we don't see it in young patients, and the rib notching does not occur on a particular side if the coarctation is proximal to the subclavian artery on that particular side. Uh, remember that the uh, uh, inter intercostal arteries uh, are uh, going to be uh, coming off of or related to the internal mammary artery, uh, which uh, is a branch of the subclavian artery. We may also see left ventricular prominence, and the most important finding is uh, the figure of three sign here as we look at the descending thoracic aorta. So here's a diagram here or drawing showing us the coarctation and why we get rib notching. Notice that we have the internal mammary arteries here coming down. These come off the subclavian arteries and there's these intercostal arteries will dilate as they will be carrying blood back to the descending thoracic aorta distal to the coarctation. So these intercostal arteries then um, have to be located within the high pressure region here of the circulation in order to be carrying the blood flow back to the descending thoracic aorta. Hence the uh, subclavian artery uh, must be proximal to the coarctation in order to develop the rib notching 
on that particular side. So if the coarctation were for some reason proximal to this subclavian artery, then we would not have rib notching on this particular side as the intercostal vessels would not be dilated. And then here we have on this MR angiogram, we have these dilated internal mammary arteries, these dilated and tortuous intercostal arteries, and you can see this rather extensive region of coarctation there in the proximal descending thoracic aorta. Now, uh, coarctation is not, however, the only thing that causes rib notching, and the point of this exercise is not for you to memorize all of these distant, all of these different causes, but just to realize that coarctation is not the only thing that can do that. So thrombus uh, causing obstruction of the aorta, a blalock procedure from, uh, from the uh, sacrifice of the subclavian artery resulting in, in obstruction on, on that particular side, Takayasu's disease, uh, uh, aortitis, which can also result in subclavian artery obstruction. So arterial diseases can result in uh, tortuosity of the intercostal arteries and rib notching. Pulmonary oligemia uh, from these various causes can uh, also result in tortuosity of intercostal arteries as they try to act uh, uh, as a collateral flow uh, to, uh, to the lungs. Uh, not just the intercostals, but other arteries also can dilate. Venous obstruction, here we can get dilatation of the veins the intercostal veins acting as collaterals, which can also result in rib notching. AV malformations, neurofibromatosis here from proliferation of, the, uh, uh, of these tumors, of these neurofibromas that can result in rib notching. And then of course, there's always idiopathic and normal as other ideologies of rib notching. So coarctation is not the only thing that can result in rib notching. Uh, pectus deformity, uh, so on the frontal view, a clue that you may be dealing with pectus uh, is that the ribs have kind of this, these anterior ribs have more of a vertical orientation. Heart is also slightly displaced towards the left side and you see all of this vascularity down here uh, that is revealed because the heart now is displaced towards the left and you see these vessels down here that you're not used to looking at because the right heart border is uh, usually over them. Pectus best seen on the lateral view where you can see the deformity here of the sternum pushing in and that's what results in the heart being deviated towards the left side. Now pectus can also be associated with certain uh, heart diseases. One of them is Marfan's and with Marfan's we get annual aortic ectasia. So here on this black blood MRI sagittal image, and here's the MR angiogram. We can see this dilatation of the ascending aorta coming down to the aortic root. So that can be associated with Marfan's annulo aortic ectasia from cystic medial necrosis. And then here also, we have a little bit of aortic valve regurgitation. You can see that jet going back into the left ventricle from the region of the aortic valve. So as the ascending aorta dilates and the aortic root dilates, that can result in aortic regurgitation. So a pectus deformity can be associated with Marfan's and annulo aortic ectasia. Can also be associated with mitral valve prolapse. So pectus can all can also, in addition to Marfan's, can also be associated with mitral valve prolapse. So what is situs? Situs is the particular configuration uh, of the organs within the body, the organs within the, within the chest, the configuration of those organs uh, tend to correlate with the configuration of organs within the abdomen. Hence, when we have normal situs, we have the trilobe lung on the right side and the liver on the right side, so they tend to be on the same side. The bilobe lung on the left side along with the spleen on the left side, and the heart here has this normal configuration. When we have complete situs inversus or situs inversus totalis, then we're dealing with a mirror image uh, of a normal person. And so there, the liver and the trilobe lung are on the left side. The bilobe lung and the spleen will be on the right side. And you can see that the configuration of the heart is the mirror image of normal. But there can be conditions which can be somewhat confusing. So here, it looks like the liver is symmetrically placed here in the midline. 
the cardiac apex seems to be on the wrong side. So here we have some kind of situs abnormality. This is called situs ambiguous. And situs ambiguous can be associated or is typically associated with the, the, the heterotaxy syndromes. So there's asplenia and polysplenia are the two heterotaxy syndromes. Asplenia tends to be associated with very severe congenital cardiac malformations. So that will be diagnosed in infancy. But if you have a situs uh, uh, ambiguous abnormality like this and more of an adult patient, then it should make you think of polysplenia since that is associated with milder congenital heart disease and more likely to present in the adult as a heterotaxy. So the most important factors when we're evaluating the, the uh, radiograph uh, for cardiac disease in an adult are these factors really, starting with the pulmonary vascularity, and then we'll discuss the rest of these as we get to them. So there are five states of pulmonary vascularity that are accessible on the chest radiograph, and normal, of course, is one of them. Then we have pulmonary venous hypertension, which we associate with pulmonary edema, uh, congestive heart failure. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, this gives us a centralized pattern of the pulmonary vascularity on the chest radiograph. We can have increased pulmonary blood flow or pulmonary hyperemia. This is often associated with left to right shunts. Or we can have decreased pulmonary blood flow or pulmonary oligemia which can be associated with right to left uh, shunts. So normally on the upright chest radiograph, the vessels within the lower lungs are somewhat more prominent than the vessels within the upper lungs. Uh, we can have an overall decrease in pulmonary vascularity, pulmonary oligemia. We can have overall increased pulmonary vascularity, pulmonary hyperemia. So this can be associated with left to right shunts. This can be associated with right to left shunts. We can have a centralized pattern where the vessels in the center, the central pulmonary arteries appear enlarged, but the arteries in the periphery are somewhat pruned in appearance. That appearance is associated with pulmonary hypertension. We can have pulmonary edema or congestive, uh, which can go on to congestive heart failure from pulmonary venous hypertension. Here we start with vascular redistribution where the uh, pulmonary vasculature, especially the venous vessels here in the upper lungs are more prominent than they are within the lower lungs. So those are the states of pulmonary vascularity that can be assessed on the chest radiograph. So for normal pulmonary vascularity, the vessels within the lower lungs are somewhat more prominent than the vessels within the upper lungs. And again, this uh, needs to be judged on an upright chest radiograph. Normally the interlobar pulmonary artery, the normal measurement is about nine to 16 millimeters in diameter. So uh, this is actually an angiogram that was done in the upright position uh, to show you how the vessels, because of gravitational dependence, these vessels within the lower part of the lung are somewhat larger and more prominent than the vessels within the upper part of the lung. So that's gravity dependent, judged on an upright chest X-ray and that is normal. Now, when we have pulmonary venous hypertension, now the vessels in the upper part of the lung start to become more prominent. We call this cephalization, especially the veins here within the upper parts of the lung. And uh, you do need to be familiar with these numbers, the grading of pulmonary venous hypertension based on the appearance of the chest radiograph. So a normal chest radiograph is associated with pulmonary venous wedge pressure less than 12 millimeters of mercury. When we have grade one pulmonary venous hypertension, we get cephalization. There we have 12 to 19 millimeters of mercury as far as the pulmonary venous wedge pressure. With grade two pulmonary venous hypertension, we have interstitial edema. So we're up to 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury. And then when we get to grade three pulmonary venous hypertension, now the fluid spills out into the alveolar spaces. We have consolidations and alveolar edema. So that is associated with pulmonary venous wedge pressures greater than 25. With chronic disease, the venous pressure can be uh, up to five millimeters higher associated with these findings on the chest radiograph. So grade one pulmonary venous hypertension gives us vascular redistribution. As we've said, normally the upper lobe vessels are smaller than the lower lobe vessels due to the differences in hydrostatic pressure. 
but to be accurate we need to judge this on an upright chest radiograph if the upper lobe vessels are larger or equal in size to the lower lobe vessels that indicates redistribution of blood flow most likely due to pulmonary venous hypertension we may also see cardiomegaly and widening of the vascular pedicle especially towards the right so here in this example notice these prominent veins here uh, these pulmonary veins in the upper portion of the lung in this patient who has a, a little bit of cephalization uh, and you can see the superior vena cava here is also distended a little bit towards the right uh, because of uh, the uh, the uh, pulmonary venous hypertension and increased intravascular volume in this particular case so here is the patient with the cephalization and pulmonary venous hypertension notice the superior vena cava here is distended more to the right here is the patient with more normal fluid status and again you can see that vascular pedicle towards the right is not as wide as the superior vena cava is not distended and here we are looking at the diameter of the azagous vein so when we judge this on serial upright chest radiographs looking at the degree of distension of the superior vena cave and the diameter of the azagous vein it gives us some idea of the uh, it gives us some idea uh, of the fluid status of the patient so here the the patient has increased intravascular fluid volume and has vascular redistribution uh, resulting from their grade one pulmonary venous hypertension so what forms the vascular pedicle well on the right We've already said this is formed by the superior vena cava and on the left this is formed by an arterial structure the left subclavian vein so the vascular pedicle on the right is formed by the superior vena cava and the left border of the vascular pedicle here is the left subclavian vein so widening of the vascular pedicle towards the right is usually associated with increased blood volume and increased central venous pressure now with grade two interstitial edema, we develop, uh, uh, or with grade two pulmonary venous hypertension, we develop interstitial edema. So this is manifested as these curly lines, especially curly B lines, which are these lines in the periphery at right angles to the visceral pleural surface. So those are curly B lines. They result from interlobular septal thickening. We can also see curly A lines and curly C lines. So all of these result from interlobular septal thickening. We might have some parabronchial cuffing, hyalur haze, thickened fissures from subpleural edema. So curly B lines are the most common. So all of these are caused by interlobular septal thickening. Curly B lines are in the periphery. Curly A lines radiate out from the hyaline. Curly C lines are just overlapping of curly A lines and curly B lines. So here's a patient with an AICD device, cardiomegaly. You can see that they've had some uh, cardiac surgery. Very nice example of curly B lines here in the periphery and vascular redistribution here. So this patient has grade two pulmonary venous hypertension. This patient has interstitial edema. So the uh, curly B lines or the curly lines in general are caused by interlobular septal thickening. So these outline, these interlobular septa, they outline the secondary pulmonary lobules and they become thickened when we have interstitial edema. And here's the equivalent on the CT scan and on the chest radiograph that is manifest, that manifests as these curly lines, curly B lines in the periphery of the chest radiograph. When we get grade three pulmonary venous hypertension, now we have alveolar edema as the fluid spills out into the alveolar spaces. So classically, you might have a perihyalar distribution of consolidations, the so-called bat wing pattern or butterfly pattern of consolidations. We might also have pleural effusions, uh, not unusual to see cardiomegaly. And these consolidations may change rapidly and the distribution uh, may also depend on the patient's position. So if the patient is right side down uh, continuously, then the consolidations might be worse on the right side uh, because of that gravitational effect. So this perihyalur butterfly distribution of consolidations or bat wing distribution of consolidations is a very typical appearance of alveolar edema. Now, yeah, here's some nice examples as to what happens to the vascular pedicle in these various stages of hydration. So here, when this particular patient is dehydrated, superior vena cava is not distended towards the right. Notice the diameter of the azagous vein here is very thin. 
here as the patient is being hydrated and is now has normal hydration then we can see the shadow of the superior vena cava a little bit more towards the right than it is in the dehydrated state and we can see the diameter here of the azeous vein is somewhat greater than in the prior radiograph here the patient is overhydrated, and now we can see the diameter of the azeous vein much bigger than it was in the preceding radiographs and the superior vena cava much more distended towards the right so looking at the vascular pedicle here the, the looking at the uh, superior vena cava and the azeous vein on serial chest radiographs on the same patient can give you some idea of the intravascular fluid volume and the fluid status for that particular patient now next we'll discuss some signposts that you have to be familiar with on the chest radiograph as noticing abnormalities here do can point to certain uh, adult cardiac diseases or cardiac diseases that manifest in the adult. So aortic enlargement, enlargement of the pulmonary artery, left atrial enlargement, right atrial enlargement. Uh, these, uh, these are abnormalities we want to be able to pick up on the chest radiograph. So for the great vessels, we always want to evaluate the aorta and the pulmonary artery on your chest radiograph. So here's the aortic knob. Here is the main pulmonary artery here and as we've said before right below that this next bump here is the left atrial appendage so you want to get in the habit of evaluating each of those on your chest radiograph so when we look on this chest radiograph we notice that uh, the aortic this aortic knob here seems to be on the right side here's the descending thoracic aorta here also on the right side trachea is somewhat deviated to the left so this patient has a right aortic arch on the lateral view notice this indentation here on the posterior border of the trachea what is causing that will in an adult with a right aortic arch they're well, likely most likely to have an aberrant left subclavian artery and that left subclavian artery goes behind the trachea and the esophagus to get from the right side to the left side and at the origin of that vessel you may have this dilatation this this is called the diverticulum of Camarel here associated with the origin of an aberrant subclavian artery and as that goes behind the trachea and the esophagus you can see on the sagittal reconstruction how it can cause deviation of the trachea anteriorly and can also kind of narrow the esophagus here in this region so patients with uh, diverticulum of Camarel can develop dysphagia lusoria from compression of the esophagus uh, by this diverticulum of Camarel so these are associated with an aberrant subclavian artery either a right arch and an aberrant left subclavian artery or a left arch with an aberrant right subclavian artery either of those might have a diverticulum of Camarel at the origin of the aberrant subclavian artery so here we have the arrow pointing to this uh, tortuosity here of the ascending aorta and on the lateral view we notice these calcifications in the region of the aortic valve so whenever we see calcifications of a valve on a radiograph it indicates stenosis of that valve so this patient has aortic valvular stenosis and here we have post stenotic dilatation of the ascending aorta causing that bulging here towards the right now we can have enlargement of the entire aorta so here the ascending and descending aorta are both enlarged this can be caused by aortic insufficiency by aortic valve regurgitation Hence, we also have a dilated dilatation here of the heart and dilatation of the left ventricle. You can also have dilatation of the ascending and descending aorta from systemic hypertension. That can also give you dilatation of the ascending and descending aorta, although the heart does not dilate until we have decompensation when we're dealing with systemic hypertension. So here's a case of a young patient with a tortuous ascending aorta somewhat tortuous descending aorta heart is not really enlarged this is a patient with systemic hypertension which results in uh, this tortuosity of the ascending and descending aorta in this example when we evaluate uh, our moguls on the left side we notice there's this marked enlargement here of the main pulmonary artery segment the right pulmonary artery here is also enlarged so on the lateral view we notice there's a uh, 
There's enlargement here along the outflow tract of the right ventricle. Here's the left pulmonary artery going up and over the left upper lobe bronchus. That appears enlarged. This is superimposition here of the main and the right pulmonary artery, which also appears enlarged on the lateral view. So this patient has a centralized pattern, and this is associated with pulmonary hypertension. So here's another example of a patient with marked enlargement of the central pulmonary arteries. This patient uh, also has, we see this linear calcification of the aorta, aortic knob, but there's also this linear calcification of the pulmonary artery. So in addition to enlarged central pulmonary arteries, this patient also has pulmonary arterial calcification. So here's the CT scan confirms the enlargement of the central pulmonary arteries and this pulmonary arterial calcification. So there's pretty much no differential for pulmonary arterial calcification when we see it and indicates long-standing pulmonary artery hypertension. And in this patient, we see the central lobular emphysema. So this patient's lung disease of central lobular emphysema was the cause of this patient's pulmonary artery hypertension. Now we will discuss pulmonary hypertension later on in this course, uh, but briefly we can divide this, uh, the causes of pulmonary hypertension into precapillary and postcapillary causes uh, of pulmonary hypertension. I find that the easiest way to discuss pulmonary hypertension from the radiological point of view. Now here we have a chest radiograph and we will look carefully. We notice uh, as we are following the moguls down, there is this bump here and that is just below the region of the main pulmonary artery. So this bump is in the region of the left atrial appendage. And then here, when we look over the right heart border, there is a double density. So that indicates that there's enlargement of the left atrium. And then here on the lateral view, notice a little bit of bulging here in the region of the left atrium. Looks like the left lower lobe bronchus is displaced just slightly posteriorly. So this patient has left atrial enlargement with enlargement of the left atrial appendage. When we see that, that usually points to the mitral valve. So we have to consider mitral valve disease, especially mitral stenosis and rheumatic heart disease. So left atrial enlargement is associated with mitral valve disease, mitral stenosis. You can also see it with mitral regurgitation. Although there, if it is severe, the left ventricle may also be enlarged. Now we can also see left atrial enlargement uh, associated with atrial fibrillation. Uh, enlargement of the left atrial appendage is strongly associated with rheumatic mitral valve disease. And we can also get left atrial enlargement from increased resistance to left atrial emptying. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, constrictive pericarditis, restrictive cardiomyopathy, these are some rarer causes of left atrial enlargement. But when we see left atrial enlargement, especially when we see enlargement of the left atrial appendage, we want to consider mitral valve stenosis or rheumatic heart disease first. And so in this example, we have this enlargement of the main pulmonary artery, enlargement of the left atrial appendage, a nice double density here behind the right heart border, a little bit of vascular redistribution. So this patient has a rheumatic heart disease with mitral stenosis and develop pulmonary venous hypertension secondary to that. And then as a complication, develop pulmonary arterial hypertension, which manifests as this enlargement of the central pulmonary artery there. A nice double density here uh, with some lateral displacement of the left atrial appendage, indicating enlargement of the left atrium. Now on this chest radiograph, when we look at the configuration of the heart, we notice this bulging towards the right. So that indicates enlargement of the right atrium. And if we have isolated enlargement of the right atrium, that usually points to the tricuspid valve. So we need to consider tricuspid valve diseases. Uh, tricuspid regurgitation is uh, much more common than tricuspid stenosis, uh, especially in the adult. So tricuspid valve regurgitation uh, might be a consideration here for this particular patient. Um, in adult patients, that can be associated with tricuspid valve endocarditis. So that can be an additional uh, consideration. So isolated dilatation of the right atrium. Usually the right ventricle may also be dilated, especially with severe tricuspid valve regurgitation, but dilatation of the right atrium in an adult should point to the tricuspid valve. So here we have this dilated right atrium here.
in this patient. Also, there's dilatation of the inferior vena cava. So this was a patient with tricuspid valve regurgitation. And as we've said, sometimes that can result from endocarditis, especially from uh, IV drug abuse. Now, we can divide heart diseases into small heart diseases where the cardiothoracic ratio is less than about 0.5. And so these diseases, aortic stenosis, hypertension, so these are, these are of course pressure overload lesions, mitral stenosis, acute myocardial infarction, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, constrictive pericarditis. These do not typically cause enlargement of the cardiac silhouette, as opposed to diseases that are large heart diseases, which do give you enlargement of the cardiac silhouette. They're the cardiothoracic ratio greater than 0.5. So here we have volume overload lesions like aortic valve regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, tricuspid regurg, high output states, congestive cardiomyopathy, ischemic cardiomyopathy, pericardial effusions, pericardiac masses, all of these will give you enlargement of the cardiac silhouette. So if we're dealing with a young patient, a 30-year-old patient here, and we look at this cardiac silhouette and we see that this appears enlarged and maybe a little bit of vascular redistribution here. So uh, if indeed uh, uh, the, this uh, enlarged cardiac silhouette on a chest radiograph is abnormal in a 30-year-old, the next test we should recommend is echocardiography. Uh, especially if we're considering a cardiomyopathy, which was the case in, in this particular patient. Now here in this patient, there's marked enlargement here of the cardiac silhouette or the cardiac shadow on this chest radiograph. And so here, uh, again, we might consider cardiomyopathy, uh, but another consideration when we have enlargement of the cardiac silhouette, especially uh, if it is something that occurs acutely, is a large pericardial effusion. So again, we should recommend echocardiography. And in this patient, this patient had a large pericardial effusion that was causing that enlargement of the cardiac silhouette on the chest radiograph. So let's look at a few cases here. So again, we'd like to start with the pulmonary vascularity. When we look at the pulmonary vascularity here, we notice that there is a centralized pattern, marked enlargement here of the central pulmonary artery, enlargement of the right and left pulmonary artery on the lateral view. We can see the enlargement of the left pulmonary artery as it goes up and over the left upper low bronchus. This is the main and right pulmonary artery there superimposed uh, on the chest radiograph, which is also enlarged. So this looks like a patient who has pulmonary hypertension. So we have pulmonary artery hypertension, normal vascular pedicle in here also on the lateral view, it looks like there's some enlargement uh, of the right ventricle encroaching on the retrosternal clear space. So as we said, we can think of pulmonary hypertension, precapillary and postcapillary causes for precapillary causes, chronic pulmonary embolism, left to right shunt, idiopathic or primary pulmonary hypertension, chronic lung disease, postcapillary causes, chronic left ventricular failure, mitral stenosis. These are the most common postcapillary causes. Although these are usually associated with evidence of pulmonary venous hypertension in addition to the findings of pulmonary artery hypertension. So this patient had no lung disease, no left ventricular failure. This was a precapillary cause of pulmonary hypertension. In this particular example, this was idiopathic. This was primary pulmonary hypertension. Now, when we look at this radiograph, uh, again, uh, we look here and we notice that, uh, well, the aortic knob is over here, but again, there's marked enlargement of the main pulmonary artery. The central pulmonary arteries here are enlarged, but the pulmonary vasculature seems to be enlarged or dilated all the way to the periphery of the lung. So this is a case of pulmonary hyperemia or increased pulmonary blood flow in this particular patient. And when we look on the lateral view, again, it looks like there's some enlargement of the right ventricle here on the lateral view. There are no abnormal calcifications. So we have increased pulmonary blood flow, normal vascular pedicle. So the blood volume is not increased. The superior vena cava there is normal. We have enlargement of the right ventricle here and some enlargement maybe also of the right atrium on the frontal view. So an enlargement of the pulmonary artery. So here we 
when we have increased pulmonary blood flow, what, what are the things we can consider? Well, we might have increased pulmonary blood volume. We might have increased cardiac output. Or we might have a left to right shunt. So here's an example of anemia causing increased cardiac output and pulmonary hyperemia. In our particular case, we have increased pulmonary blood flow, normal vascular pedicle, so the, uh, so the blood volume is normal. And as we said, there's enlargement of the right atrium, right ventricle, and the pulmonary artery. So this kind of points us in the direction of a left to right shunt. And when we look here on this MRI of a four chamber view, left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle, notice that there's dilatation of the right atrium and the right ventricle. And here we have a large atrial septal defect, which was causing the left to right shunt in this patient. So the atrial septal defect is the most common of the left to right shunts that you might diagnose or that might present in the adult patient. So this was an example, as we've said, of an atrial septal defect. Okay, so moving on to this case. So here, when we look at the pulmonary vascularity, some prominence in the upper lungs here. So there's some cephalization. Uh, when we look at the cardiac chambers, uh, here's the aorta, main pulmonary artery, somewhat prominent, but there's this bump right over here, and you need to be able to recognize that right away. So there's enlargement of the left atrial appendage. When we look on the lateral view, right here, we can see enlargement of the left atrium. So here we have a patient with cephalization, evidence of pulmonary venous hypertension with enlargement of the left atrium. There are no abnormal calcifications. So this points us in the direction of the mitral valve. So here we need to suspect rheumatic heart disease with mitral stenosis in this particular patient. Vascular redistribution, pulmonary venous hypertension, normal vascular pedicle, enlarged left atrium, maybe some enlargement here of the right ventricle, Left atrium is enlarged on the lateral view, but notice this bump, the enlargement of the left atrial appendage, which clues you right in that there's a problem here with the left atrium, and in this case, the mitral valve. So on this fourth chamber view, here's an enlarged left atrium. Here is the mitral valve. We see that it is not opening all the way. There's that little jet here uh, going into the left ventricle during diastole. So this is a patient with rheumatic heart disease and mitral valve stenosis. Now here in our next case, we notice the pulmonary vascularity here actually looks decreased, which is unusual in an adult patient. Uh, the great vessels here kind of look uh, kind of look okay. When we look at the cardiac chambers, there seems to be enlargement of the right atrium and some enlargement here of the right ventricle. There are no abnormal calcifications. So we have decreased pulmonary blood flow. We have enlargement, uh, looks like, of the right atrium and the, the right ventricle. So when we have decreased pulmonary blood flow, that can be caused by decreased blood volume. It can be caused by decreased right ventricular function from decreased right ventricular output. Or it can also be caused by right to left shunts. That can also give you decreased pulmonary blood flow. So in this case, we have decreased pulmonary blood flow, normal vascular pedicle, enlargement of the right atrium and the right ventricle. So here on this MRI, we notice that there is some dilatation of the right atrium and the right ventricle. Notice the interventricular septum here deviated to the left side. When we look here at the tricuspid valve, we notice that this septal leaflet of the valve is displaced towards the apex of the ventricle, giving us some atrialization of this portion of the ventricle, this is a patient with Epstein's anomaly. So Epstein's uh, is the type of right to left shunt that, um, especially mild Epstein's, that might present in, the, in an adult patient. And here, it's because of this malformation of the tricuspid valve, especially that septal leaflet displaced towards the apex, that we can make the diagnosis in this particular, pace, in this particular case. We will discuss Epstein's in more detail later on in this course. So we have a case here of Epstein's anomaly presenting in this adult patient. So here in this case, in our next case, the pulmonary vascularity looks normal. Cardiac chambers don't really appear that enlarged. They look okay. Heart looks normal in size. Great vessels, vascular pedicle looks okay. Now when we look for calcification on the lateral view, we notice that there are these abnormal calcifications there overlying the heart shadow. So that's the region of the aortic valve. 
So normal blood flow, normal heart, calcifications on the lateral view in the region of the aortic valve. This is a patient with aortic valvular stenosis. So if we see calcification of a valve on a chest radiograph, it always means stenosis of that valve. So here we can see the aortic valve with calcifications and we see on this cardiac gated CT that the valve is not opening all the way. This is a patient with aortic valvular stenosis. Now this particular appearance here in our next case is somewhat of an ant mini. If we see this on a chest radiograph, we notice that the heart here is displaced towards the left side. Notice that it looks like there is lung tissue here coming in underneath the heart. There is notching here in the region of the aortopulmonary window. So this configuration uh, is kind of an ant mini on a chest radiograph. And here's a CT showing us heart displaced towards the left side lung tissue getting in here underneath the heart, between the heart and the diaphragm, lung tissue getting into the aortopulmonary window. So this is congenital absence uh, of the pericardium. So the pericardium, uh, without the pericardium here on the left side, the heart loses its diaphragmatic attachment, hence lung tissue gets underneath the heart. The heart gets displaced towards the left side. And also because of the lack of the pericardium here, lung tissue can get into the aortal pulmonary window. So this configuration of abnormalities is classic for congenital absence of the left pericardium. So we can recognize that on the plain film, heart displaced towards the left side, lung tissue underneath the heart, lung tissue getting into the aortal pulmonary window, all because of absence of the pericardium, absence of the left pericardium. Okay, so that, that concludes our discussion of the plain film approach to adult heart disease. Um, and I thank you for your attention and we'll see you next time.